Hello, I'm Kat. I'm so grateful to Rosalie and to SOCAP. Rosalie has joined the advisory board for Defy Ventures. Last year was my first time ever here at SOCAP, and we got to present Defy, and what we do at Defy is we transform the hustle of people who did prison time, we transform it into legal hustle and help them to start businesses, and we fund it and incorporate, help them to incorporate their businesses, and then we incubate them. And last year, when I came here to Defy, or I'm sorry, to SOCAP, I came out from New York, we were just a New York-based organization, and I said, I have a dream that one day we will be able to serve people nationally. And you people of SOCAP heard my plea, and you made this dream happen. And so I'm here to give a big, huge love bomb to SOCAP. And people in this audience, when we spoke last year, heard it, and in the audience was Google.org and the KPORs as well, Mitch and Frida. And they provided the funding. We got $500,000 from Google.org, and we got $250,000 from Mitch and Frida to be able to make the dream a reality. We have used that money. Yeah, thank you. So in the past year, we were able to use that money to establish a presence here in the Bay Area where we now serve people. And we have been able to incubate 112 businesses that have been started by men and women who serve time, who are transforming their hustle into legal businesses. Right here, this is Odwin Chambers. He's one of our legal entrepreneurs from Oakland originally, and he makes these, these hats. And uh, the coolest development for Defy that has come out of the SOCAP love is that just one year into it, we are not only serving men and women who have been released from prison and equipping them, but now we are also inside jails and prisons nationally. We're serving here inside San Francisco jails and the California Department of Corrections, and later this month, we are also working in the federal prison system with women. So I can't even express my gratitude sufficiently for what it has been for us to be able to come and get in front of people like yourselves. The reason, the other reason that I'm here today besides giving this love bomb to SOCAP is to get to introduce our next panel that is up to some very important work. The reason that I have devoted my life to working with people inside and outside of prisons is because I believe that they represent America's biggest underdogs and America's most overlooked talent pool. And I do this work because of my hatred for injustice. And every day, I know and love people who have suffered from economic injustice and racial injustice that is plaguing our country in a very big way. A couple of statistics for you. By the age of 23, the young age of 23, 30% of Americans already have criminal histories. 50% of black men already have criminal histories. And for people who don't know a whole lot about this sector, you may think, well, you wouldn't probably say this out loud, maybe it's because black people are committing all the crimes. Wrong. In America, the majority of crime, of drug dealing and drug using crime, is done by whites. Yet, in our jails and prisons, 75% of people who are locked up over drug-related crimes are African American or Latino. And in San Francisco, in our great city here, only 6% of the population here is African American, yet 44% of the people who are locked up in our prisons are African American. There is so much that is going wrong in our country, and six months ago, I got to seek out and meet somebody that I admire very much. His name is Ben Jealous. He's a former president and CEO of the NAACP, and he has given his whole life to bringing justice to this sector. So Ben is on this next panel. I talked Ben into joining Defy's advisory board recently, and Ben and a panel are now going to lead us in an amazing discussion on something that is so important in America. I'm really grateful that SOCAP has given this audience to us in this time. So we're going to welcome them up in the way that we do things at Defy. We start, I want you to start with a little level one golf clap, polite, polite, okay? This is how many people introduce up an audience, but they're better than that. So I'm gonna get all the way up to 10 and I want a level 10 clap. So bring it up the volume a little bit to two, three, we're gonna give it up for this panel, four, five, more, a little more, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Come on the biggest, go. There we go, thank you. Yeah.
Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Wow, it's a lot more people. Ooh, there. nice. Um, ben, can you hear us okay? Uh oh. Hello, Ben. We can see your mouth moving. We can see your mouth moving. <laughs> ah, there we go. All right, hey. <laughs> um, my name is Decker Gongang. I'm a senior fellow at Frontline <laughs> Solutions. And we're having an intimate conversation on equity, uh, equity issues. Um, you can call it racial equity, you can call it gender equity. Um, but what uh, the, the first kind of one, along with your introduc introductions of yourselves, um, I would love for you to talk through, like, what does equity mean to you? Um, oh, wow. <laughs> equity butterfly. Um, we talk about diversity, um, whether it be gender diversity or racial diversity, and we kind of remain, the language remains in this vague, ambiguous space. Um, or it remains in this kind of like, oh, well, we need more brown faces, or we need this. Um, I would love for you all to kind of talk through what equity and inclusion means to you, um, and then how do you see it in your, your work? Yeah. Well, I'm Nikki Silvestri. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Silvestri Strategies, and we work on climate and food systems economic development. Mm -hmm. When I think about equity, I think about agency, honestly. That there's so many ways that I could define equity based on the work that I've done, mm -hmm. but the hardest thing with economic development is to bring a group of people and a community into relationship with the resources and the people that they need to actually have agency over their own future and their own economic development work. So that's what equity means to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm Ed Duggar, I'm president of Reinventure Capital, which is a venture fund in formation. Uh, I have a long history as a pioneer in uh, impact investing over 20 years. Uh, and um, equity, let me, let me turn it around just a little bit because equity has to do, and this session has to do with race and diversity. And, and race is weird. Um, race is a social construct. Uh, but for most of us, it's also a sort of a, a social, sh a social shorthand, and it's a social shorthand about that begins to define privilege. If you think about privilege, um, opportunity is shared privilege. Okay, so I want to share a little bit about how I experience race. Most of my life, it went by the one percent rule. In other words, if I had one percent black in me. I was black. That was most of my life. And then when Obama was elected, suddenly people turned to me, most of whom I didn't know, and say, are you biracial? So my status in life went up. <laughs> I was the same, but my status, my sense of privilege went up. And most recently, I was talking to someone, dear, a very nice woman, white woman, who said, and I told her my background, and she said, uh, I said I was black. And she said, do you, uh, do you mean that you were adopted by a black family? And I said, no. So suddenly I became an honorary white person, <laughs> which was the highest status whatsoever. So race is convenient. Uh, race changes depending on the circumstances. Race changes in terms of how people perceive you in terms of the privilege and opportunity you should have. Ben? ben. Could you restate the question? I, I was so lost in what he's talking about. I, I could keep going <laughs> on that tangent, but I want to make sure that I answer your question. Yeah, we're, we're, we're asking one, as along with introducing yourself, um, sure. is how you see the complexities and nuances around equity and race, um, and how you, in your role in KPOR, or um, in your previous roles, have seen it play out. Got you. So I'm Ben Jealous. I'm the former national president, CEO of the NAACP. I'm a general partner at Cape Work Capital. We invest in seed stage social impact tech. You know, the, um, I guess I deal with equity and race in very concrete terms. And what we're concerned about at Cape Work Capital and the Cape Work Center for Social Impact, for instance, is just, you know, quite simply, um, if we assume that genius is is you know, occurs at the same rate in every zip code, are we making sure that we're tapping into the genius in every zip code in this country? Mm -hmm. When we look at our schools, does it appear that our schools are um, you know, 
sort of clear, powerful conduits for young uh, geniuses onto the opportunities, um, uh, you know, that, 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 that are there. Uh, you know, if, you know, and, and as investors, what we're, what we're really concerned about is, are all of the ideas that could both create high growth businesses and um, uh, help close gaps in our society, because we're social impact investors, uh, are they being accessed? Or are we sending millions of geniuses headed towards prison and uh, millions more not even teaching them how to read? And are we simply letting lots of great ideas just wither on the vine of a country uh, that is riddled with injustice and racism uh, and discrimination of various sorts. And so, you know, I think it's important that we kind of, you know, given this crowd that we really focus um, on our responsibility, if you will, to, to, to be um, ensuring that the great ideas get to us uh, and ensuring that our country taps into all the genius that it possibly, that it possibly can. I want to piggyback on one of your, your comments and open up a question for everybody. We, when we come to conferences like this, we often assume that there's kind of like this boogeyman, that, that we're here to solve a social good problem. Um, but with this one, I think in this last year and a half, we've had probably a more intense conversation as a nation than we've ever had around structural racialization. Can you talk through what, um, beyond our intent, beyond our, our goodwill, what um, these challenges, these barriers are in society? Um, um, thinking about education, whether it be climate change, whether it be community organizations, how, what do those barriers look like? Um, not even just from an investment standpoint, but how do folks experience it? You know, I, story time. Story time. Yes, yes, yes. When it comes to the kind of barriers people encounter, the word that comes up for me is relationship. Hmm. That there is a pipeline. The young man who goes to jail because he didn't pay a parking ticket, but can't stop driving his car because that's the only source of transportation he has to get to his job, and he has a child, is in a very different situation than someone at the other end of the pipeline that may want to invest in a business that is either hiring difficult to employ individuals or who is investing in social entrepreneurship with people of color and low income people. And every step along the way, there's cultural healing work, there's soft skills training, there is, there's things as simple as how to open a bank account, how to write a check, before you even get to some of these conversations about real entrepreneurship, and that's what we're talking about. The, 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 the wealth gap and the economic inequality has widened so dramatically that the situation that I described is actually very normal for a large percentage of Americans. And we don't have the kind of relationships along the pipeline for people to even understand what they're talking about. You can ask a question and be having a conversation with someone, and it is in one ear and out the other because you're talking like this. So one of the barriers is just being able to listen, have enough humility to deeply listen to the contextual differences with the way that we operate in the world, so that when we're talking about solutions, we create things that actually work. Picking up on sort of the listening and the nuances um, in particular, um, what reInventure Capital has, does and what we've done in the past is we invest uh, in support of entrepreneurs of color and women because we believe firmly that access to capital has been uh, a very difficult problem historically, before, today, and whatever. And this listening piece is, is, is a really critical one because I want to I share with you an example of those of us who are trying to address that problem and form funds and what have you deal with this kind of thing. And here we go. I was meeting with an investment advisor um, and we were talking about issues around diversity, and suddenly he said, oh yeah, I know about affirmative action. Now this was, by the way, a very progressive group, very progressive. And so as we talked about a little bit more, um, he said, 
I describe my background, Harvard undergraduate, Princeton, successful fund, so forth and so on. And he said to me, you know, um, we have similar backgrounds. You went to Harvard, I went to Harvard, blah, 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 blah. And so why do I, we both need to be in the room at the same time? Now, I don't know how that struck you, but the way it struck me was it was me that didn't need to be in the room because we were all the same. Now, it was interesting about that was that was, to me, that was a no-win situation because it was either if I was the other, not like him, then I was not worthy and I was not needed. But if I was like him, then I was worthy but still not needed. No-win situation. And that is what we often come up against in terms of trying to do uh, what we try to do is having opportunity because it's really all about opportunity. Again, I'll say opportunity is about shared privilege. And, and Ben, uh, Frida K. Foromel often says, um, or corrects folks, or I think it's Frida or Mitch, says it's not under privilege, it's under opportunity. Um, and I noticed that you are now in your, in your role have, have started to advise entrepreneurs and, um, and also advise entrepreneurs but also speak publicly. Can you talk through um, or give us examples of what that opportunity looks like? Um, sure. I, I, actually, I, I, before I go there, I want to go back for a second to what the problem looks like, because um, I think it's helpful to talk about it on the sort of micro level we're talking about it, on the interpersonal. But we, in doing so, we can lose track of the fact that the problem is so big you can actually see it from outer space. I mean, it just, just the problem of racism and of and of segregation and mass incarceration of slavery before, you know, if, if you had a satellite uh, 150 years ago, say 160, 170 years ago, we would see massive plantations, you know, deforestation in the midst of forest in the south, lots of dark backs bent over, shoulder to shoulder picking, right? If you, um, you know, had a satellite 70 years ago, uh, and you were over cities, you would notice you had people of one hue clustered on one side of the city and people of a different hue spread out a bit more on the other side of the city. Uh, you can see the ghetto from space. And today, what you see from space in our country, if you pull back and state by state, it's pockmarked with prisons. We are the most incarcerated country on the planet. Why is that important? Well, Turns out you can also see it without a satellite. You just go into any group of young people in our country, mm -hmm. and you generally are dealing with three outcomes that are driven by mass incarceration. The first one's obvious. If you're in a prison or a jail, we got more incarcerated young people per capita than any other country on the planet. The, the next year are kind of less obvious. If you're, uh, so you, you go from that group of 18 year olds to the ones who are in college. Well, they're now, increasingly nervous because they are part of a generation that you know, they just joined that is the most indebted uh, group of college students we've ever had, the highest default rate. So what's the connection between the two? In the last 40 years, as spending on prison has gone up state by state, state subsidy of public higher education has gone down precipitously. In California 40 years ago, 11% of the state budget went to public higher education, 3% went to prisons. Five, six years ago is the last time I checked the numbers. It was 11% was going to prisons, 7.5% to public universities. That particular year, Jerry Brown had proposed that it actually be 15% to prisons and 6% to public universities. Well, unlike Harvard or Princeton or, in my case, Columbia and Oxford, when you're at a public university, when, you know, when, when government subsidy goes down, there's not like a big endowment to, to offset it. Tuition just goes up. And when public university tuition goes up, well, then private schools feel permission to raise theirs as well. And so, you know, the, the incarceration thing has been, been actually driving the student debt problem. And then you have the third group of students who are, you know, working at, at Starbucks often, uh, who simply feel that they can't afford to go to college at the, at the moment. And so we need to own that because the reality is, um, that we don't just have the most incarcerated group of black people in the country, although we tend to publicly sort of think of the incarcerated population as black, 
we have the most incarcerated white people on the planet too. And it's and it's and and there's a there's a dynamic there that, if you will, um, because we we think of you know, public prisons or public housing or public education as sort of a black space uh, that we give ourselves permission to just do horrible things with all of those institutions. Now, getting back to opportunity and to actually disrupting that, what can we do? Well, you know, kind of at the midterm level, there's all sorts of laws that, that are being passed, that can be passed to actually drive down incarceration. It's one of the things we can have hope for as we look towards 2016 and beyond is where we have increasing consensus in both, both parties. But, but, then, but then it gets down to, well, what can we do this school year? Well, this school year we can do, for instance, what we do uh, – at the Cape Horse Center for Social Impact through a program called SMASH, the Summer Math and Science Honors Program. You know, we take kids 80% to 100% free and reduced lunch schools, B and C students with promise. We give them 15 weeks of extra instruction, five years, excuse me, five weeks after their first, second, and third years of high school. And we see their trajectories bend up from, from not heading towards college or heading to a low level state school to ultimately significant numbers of them going to Cal, Stanford, MIT, and the like, all of them going to college and, and half of them going to top 50 schools. But then again, the big cluster at the top of the very top schools. What we can do as investors uh, is just simply open our doors. You know, our um, returns at Caper Capital are very, very good. And half the companies that we invest in every year, sometimes it's 48%, sometimes it's 54%, but just call it half, uh, are founded by blacks, Latinos, or women. And we don't have to try. We just keep our doors open. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that's the most important thing is that what does opportunity look like? Opportunity looks like getting a good education. And, you know, opportunity looks like, you know, a VC keeping their door open to the next great idea and not just doing kind of pattern matching that simply is just a fancy way of saying racism and sexism. And, you know, finally, the, um, and, and, and for that matter, excluding the, the overwhelming majority of the colleges in this country. I mean, we tend to focus on people from like 20 schools when we have 2000. So even you said aside race and gender, there's a lot of folks who were not, whose great ideas we aren't, we aren't hearing. And then, you know, the, the, Last thing I would say is that what opportunity, if you will, sort of a mind that's bent on increasing opportunity looks like, it looks like Jack Kemp on the 10th anniversary of the riots in South LA was getting, was about preparing to speak right after him. And he was on fire that day. He kept on talking about the school kids of South Central LA and he kept saying, our kids, our kids, our kids. And this older black woman standing next to me in the wings edge of the stage said, whose kids, she, she, she said, where is he from? I said, that's Jack Kemp. She said, I know who he is. I said, well, he said, I know what he did. Where is he from? I said, ma'am, I don't think he's, he's from here. If that's you. She said, well, then whose kids is he talking about? And I said, ma'am, I think I get your point. You know, he's not from South Central LA. But I want you to hear his point, which is that we are all citizens of this country, and so are those children, and therefore they are all our children. We are all people of this country, and so are those kids, whether they're citizens or not, and therefore they are all our children. And that's really what the problem of race, if you will, keeps us from recognizing, despite the fact, and we'll close on this, that's no more significant, skin color is no more significant than hair color or eye color. We give it all this weight that it really doesn't deserve, and we shortcut the potential of our country and our country's children in the process. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, with, with, a short of, um, with, with a short amount of time left, Nikki, I wanted to, um, to ask you about kind of the intersection of issues beyond race. So thinking about like, two defining issues of my, of my generation, um, it feels like the structural racism and then climate change. So on television and in social impact or social sector, um, conversations. Those are two large conversations. What is the intersection or interplay of over the root cause issues um, with both? Mm. <laughs> that <laughs> is a loaded question. Loaded. The word that comes up for me is desperation. There have been an increasing number of people in this country who are drawing the connection 
between the long-term impacts of extreme weather events on cities and the structural inequalities that follow. And one thing that happens when you destabilize a bunch of infrastructure at the same time through an extreme weather event is that the level of desperation of people to get their basic needs met increases. If you think mm -hmm. about groups of people who were desperate already, having an added level of desperation because of climate change, you get the perfect environment for very bad things to happen. Mm. And we are seeing that. We're seeing the desperation increase on all sides. Those who want to, quote, keep the peace and those who want to feed their children. So climate change is making a bad situation worse. And I want to end on opportunity and solutions mm. because I do actually think that no matter how dire things are, there are examples of things that are working. Um, totally unbiased, my husband's organization is doing really great work. We've been partnering with them this year. But one of the things I want to point out is the combination of things that it takes to actually do what Ben is talking about, right? If so many young black men are incarcerated and then they get out of prison, what do we do with them? The organizations that have figured out how to get that young man from I walked out of prison today to being an entrepreneur have a few things in common. One is that they know they need to invest in cultural healing. It's something that I mentioned before, but I want to explain a little bit about what that means. The level of rage and utter just the, this pain and grief that it is to live in survival mode and to watch your people crack before your eyes is indescribable. Mm -hmm. It's just indescribable. That requires investment to deal with that. It requires time. It requires real resources. It is not something intangible that can't be measured. It is actually a, just as necessary as the hard skills. Mentorship is necessary. The things that keep us human in the midst of surviving things that are inhuman is actually a part of our responsibility. And that's a collective responsibility. Everyone can provide the resources in the environment to make sure that our human selves thrive so that when we create economic development, when we create communities, we're creating it from a place of wholeness and not from a place of deficit. Because it's when we create from a place of deficit that things end up cracking apart because of interpersonal issues or because the business just didn't work out. But what it takes to actually create the conditions for wholeness requires, again, humility and listening because everybody is missing pieces when it comes to do that. <laughs> that is graduate calculus level stuff that I'm talking about right there. <laughs> and it's gonna require all of us. Mm -hmm. Ed, um, uh, Gracie Dogs, who, who recently passed away, said that the next American Revolution will be about reinventing institutions and, and thinking through your path and your experience um, and your, your story that you shared with us. Mm -hmm. Can you talk through, like, what is, as we look ahead, what is the reinvention? What is the, the, mm. the, the reinvention of not only these spaces, but the, the space that you reside in? Yes. Well, first of all, you know, I keep bringing this down to a personal level because I, I want you'll find that what I have to say is, is very personal. It represents a challenge to each of us on a personal level. So the first thing that I think in terms of reinvention, we need to reinvent the whole notion of race. <laughs> it is so destructive in the way in which we use it. So that's one level of, of, of reinvention. Another level of reinvention is what I would call sort of a, sort of a, a personal revolution. Because these things begin with how people think about things. And unless people start to think about them differently, for instance, you know, the whole notion I talked about opportunity, race, um, privilege, and so forth. So how, how would we redefine race? We might, or just abolish the notion altogether. And I think Martin Luther King said it sort of very well. And I can't think of a better way to say it judged by the content of your character. So that when someone goes with a deal or this or that, we don't ask about whether we belong to the club or whether we cycle together or we have all these other things that are 
are a sort of uh, indications that we are like them, that we can really get to the base of it and say, content of the color, uh, content of the character, what are our shared values, and uh, those two things. If we can get that far, we begin to have a very different conversation about where opportunity to, is. So, reinvent ourselves. Um, and before we, we wrap this up, um, I wanted to, well, as we, as we wrap this up, I wanted to leave you all with an opportunity to um, provide closing thoughts. Um, and I'll start right back with you. Closing thoughts. Ah. Um, I would invite everyone, I think, here, as we sort of begin to leave this space, uh, to embrace a couple of the things that I said. And I think that, think about it in this way. If you were to invite someone to your home, what would they have to be or say or do to sort of feel, make you fun, comfortable doing that? And if there is something different that would be required of a person of color to come into your home, sort of check that. Check that. And see what that suggests in terms of the way you perhaps ought to rethink how you're thinking. Uh, I put it at that level because as we try to do all the things we do here, as I try to go out and raise money, as others try to make an impact in all the kinds of ways you do, I think it's important because these are really tough issues that have to do fundamentally with the history of our country and the way in which we've divided ourselves up. We have to really re-examine that and reinvent it. Go ahead. I'll re-emphasize my three key words. Humility, relationship, and listening. That we have, to, we have to value the human element just as much as we value profit. And more importantly, understand that the two are so interrelated they can't actually be detangled. It's a myth to think that you, you cannot focus on emotional intelligence and relationship and have a very successful business. Ben? <laughs> You know, just in the interest of brevity, I'll close on this. You know, the Italians have a saying, you cannot be rich and stupid for more than one generation. And the reality is that our prisons have been eating the lunch of our universities for a generation. And we will no longer be able to lead the world in innovation and job creation if we continue to in debt our college students in the way that we are and shift so many of them from a pathway towards opportunity and, and tr truly giving back to our country and towards prison. So let's go, go, go get smart on crime and start shifting that savings back into our public universities so that we can actually continue to lead this world in the way that we do. Thank you. Um, thank you all for attending uh, SOCAP, and I will pass it to the organizers for the closing. Thank, thank you. you all very thank much. Thank you.